Hello and welcome to video number three in which we're going to be looking at patterns of extinction. So let's jump right in. Remember, so now we're looking at the ultimate killers and I'm afraid this is going to be quite frustrating. Um, it's going to be captured in uncertainty, but I'll do my best to identify some common patterns for you. So it's increasingly widely thought that things called large igneous province eruptions may be the driver of many extinctions. I've put a definition for you on the slide here. It's kind of complicated, but basically what large igneous provinces are, are really big and really rapid volcanic eruptions that have occurred throughout the Phanerozoic, so the Cambrian through to um, uh, late Cretaceous period. And we certainly know that there, a temporal link between volcanism and extinction is well established in at least half of the major extinctions in the Phanerozoic. Again, remember that correlation doesn't imply causation. We need to identify in each one of those linked temporally um, extinct eruptions what may be driving the extinction. But it's, it's a good starting point to investigate this further. It implies that large-scale volcanism could be a driver of mass extinction, but the link between the two phenomena is still not fully understood. That is our um, causative mechanisms. So... For example, uh, where, what, an example of one of the places that this doesn't really make sense is the fact that some of the most voluminous large igneous provinces, um, such as the oceanic plateaus, which we see in the Cretaceous period, were in place with minimal extinction occurring. Therefore, the scale of these vents and the volume of magma, magma uh, released in these is not the only factor governing the lethality, how lethal these extinctions are. And it could be, we think now, this is down to continental configuration, perhaps, because the best examples of um, large igneous province and extinction relationships occurred with one mass continent, Pangaea. So it may be that maybe large igneous provinces are particularly important when you have a single um, continent. So that is one potential ultimate killer. Even that is tricky to be sure about, though, because many proximal kill mechanisms in large igneous provinces uh, and the associated extinction scenarios are also the kind of um, impacts that we would expect to see of from a bolide impact. So that is a um, uh, an impactor from um, outer space, basically, so an asteroid or a comet or a meteorite. Um, so. I would note that I've given you an example on this slide of a very um, famous recent meteor, and it's famous just because it was um, quite well documented from lots and lots of dash cam footage and such like, but this is tiny in comparison to anything that we're talking about that would cause a mass extinction. But when you have an impact from outer space, we would expect cooling and then warming. We would expect acidification and ozone destruction. And this means that even when we have large igneous provinces, we cannot ignore the potential impact of bolides from outer space. And indeed, um, an extraterrestrial impact that is famously implicated at the end Cretaceous crisis, as we'll talk about in one of the later videos. But I would highlight that in general, there is an absence of convincing temporal links between impacts and extinctions outside of the um, Cretaceous and Cretaceous extinction that led to the um, extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. So people have used that to argue that perhaps impactors are not the main driver of extinctions in anything other than the KPG extinction, that end Cretaceous one. Perhaps like large igneous provinces and continents, the impact site of the bolide may the impactor may play a role in the lethality of any particular impact. For example, the Chicxulub impact that drove the KPG extinction that we'll talk about in another video, struck into evaporites and carbonates, very particular kinds of rocks that then have uh, provide the potential to release large quantities of sulfur dioxide, which would have led to immediate cooling, and large quantities of carbon dioxide, which have, would have led to long-term warming. And it would have also released other volatiles because of the nature of the impact site that drove acid rain, ocean acidification and ozone depletion. So that is a potential ultimate killer 
for some but not all of our extinctions. So we've got two very sensible potential ultimate killers there, which are hard to tell from each other. We've got um, large Igneous provinces and we've got extraterrestrial impactors. A few other things have been um, mentioned in specific um, extinctions, and those include deadly bursts of cosmic gamma rays, um, which have been suggested most notably for the late Ordovician extinction. Um, and ultimately, I would say that identifying the smoking gun in ancient mass extinctions, i.e. the ultimate causes, remains a matter of conjecture. We are improving year on year as exact mechanisms and causes are, are revealed, but we still are a long way from being sure in the majority of our older extinctions. Um, this Bond paper that I've um, placed on the slide here um, is a very good place to look to understand more of the potential links between ultimate and proximal kill mechanisms in mass extinctions. A general pattern we should think about when it comes to extinctions is also what's left after an extinction has occurred. And we can draw nice big picture um, general patterns from studying the fossil record in this regard. We can say that survivors tend towards being generalists, things that can eat if they are heterotrophs, a wide range of different um, types of food. And typically um, we see survivors being species with a wider ge geographic distribution um, that al allows them I guess because they're generalists, they can live in more diverse habitats. So we, across an extinction, we get um, a move towards generalists with wider species ranges. Those taxa that do survive a mass extinction are sometimes called disaster taxa. So the first organisms back on the scene after an extinction typically include lichens, such as these um, the ones shown on this lovely rock on the left hand side here. That is a modern day example of a lichen and taxa like ferns, um, which were common after the Permo Triassic extinction. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see a really famous example of a disaster taxon. This is Lystrosaurus. It's a tusked reptile that was a disaster taxon after the big Permo Triassic extinction we're going to learn about in the next video, which was soon found in almost every corner of the sparsely populated landscape in the early Triassic. And very recent research suggests that actually um, the rise of Lystrosaurus occurred not actually after the Permatrassic extinction, but as it was occurring. So it's a very interesting um, time um, to be studying mass extinctions at the moment. Generally, we can say that biodiversity recovers after our mass extinctions in around a 5 to 10 million year time scale after the extinction event. But in the most severe mass extinctions, that could take up to 30 million years. And there is evidence of provincialization of at least land-based faunas um, towards the end of our big extinctions. What that means is that species essentially become more fragmented and their ranges become smaller as the speciation occurs before the rise of these generalists in our post-extinction landscape. So that is general-ish patterns with a lot of uncertainty, I admit, of mass extinctions. So let's move on to the next video where we're going to look at the big five mass extinctions. I'll see you there shortly.